Welcome to the Pathways to Stillness podcast series. I'm Dr. Gary Irwin Kenyon. I created this series as a follow-up to my book, Pathways to Stillness, Reflect, Release, Renew, which is available on Amazon, Indigo, and Friesen Press, and in audiobook form from Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. In this series of episodes, I am in conversation with my friend and colleague, Bill Randall. We explore pathways, or what Thomas Moore calls in another episode of this podcast, meanderings of our personal and collaborative journey with the metaphor of life as a story and the wonderful adventure that is possible if you are open to following your bliss. In this second episode, we explore the story behind our work together. I should mention that you and I, Bill, have written many things, many uh, academic journal articles. We have edited, I don't know how many books, five, six, seven, I'm not sure. So we've done a lot of collaboration together. And maybe I'll just start by saying, when I talk to uh, colleagues over the years, quite a few colleagues, and I say, oh yeah, yeah, Bill and I, uh, we're friends and we, we work together and we've written uh, uh, a lot of things, a lot of pieces together. And they say, uh, how did you do that? How, how did you do that? They say, uh, most of them say, I tried that and we ended up hating each other. So it seems we're in, we're in a rather small group. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that too. And, you know, I've written some things with other people and we didn't necessarily come out best buddies. But in your case, in the, in the case of you and I together, you know, it's, it's, it is amazing. It's a gift, really, that we've been able to pool our, our thoughts and ideas and our ways of writing and thinking in a way that's, uh, that's worked <laughs> and continues to work. I'm very grateful f- for that, uh, and I'm very grateful for crossing paths with you. My pathways to wherever, you know, <clears throat> could have turned out quite differently if, if your pathway and my pathway hadn't converged at a certain point in, in the summer of 1994. Exactly. And it's, I guess, I don't know, I haven't analyzed why we've been able to do it, but uh, uh, maybe one reason is we, we were each able to say, okay, here's how I see this topic or this piece. And, you know, you go away, write that, I'll go away, write this. And then we look it over and uh, we've been able to say, well, mm, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about that. And so the other of us was able to say, yeah, okay, I, I see your point. And um, I think some of the parts we've done on our own and say, okay, we can fit this together. But others, it's we've, we've come up with a third story, really, out of the original story that we were each writing about. And I think particularly with restoring our lives and ordinary wisdom, that's kind of, that's how I see how, how it, it became, you know, you always have to write a book that, that looks like one person wrote it. And uh, somehow we've been able to, to do that and, and maintain our, our own passion for certain things, for expressing certain things in certain ways, right? Yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> the story behind the book, Restoring Our Lives, personal growth through autobiographical reflection. Well, that got its start in 1995, didn't it? And I think we both agreed early on that we wanted to write about the narrative nature of development and aging in a way that people could use, that it could help people get a different perspective on their on their lives and take more agency or authority, if you will, in how their lives unfold. So there's that prescriptive, practical dimension to the book Restoring Our Lives that, that isn't always evident in gerontology textbooks. We wanted to make a difference, and I think you were the one that very early on had this vision of, you know, let's take gerontology and specifically narrative gerontology to the streets <laughs> in, in as many ways as we can. And um, in fact, you know, there's a whole discussion we could have about the different workshops that we've led uh, or facilitated or been part of, Gary, um, where, you know, 
ordinary people, not necessarily academic folks, would attend and we would try to give them practical tips and tools and strategies for restoring their lives in, in more life-affirming ways. Yeah, I think certainly in gerontology, I've been interested in trying to uh, share things that might make a difference in people's lives and in my life, of course, because you're always learning when you're teaching. But uh, it also made me remember way back when, when I was studying philosophy, I really enjoyed the, um, the intellectual exercise, I would say, of studying these wonderful philosophers like Kant and Hegel, besides the existentialists who I gravitated towards because they were more practical. But I did enjoy the intellectual exercise and reading those thick tomes of <laughs> classical philosophy, Aristotle, Plato, you name it, and discussing that in class. But when I started to move on with my master's and PhD, I was looking for practical philosophy. Uh, I think I teach gerontology still from a philosophical perspective. But practical philosophy, where again, it can make some difference, and and folks can get something out of it. So, a book like Restoring Our Lives is not just about ideas and concepts. There are um, suggested ways to go ahead and explore restoring your life. It may not be a coincidence that of anything that we've written together, that's the one that's most frequently cited. And the practical dimension of, of that book, for me, goes back to, I think, my, my ministry days. Because you know, I've recently been cleaning house here in my office and uh, uh, coming across files of this, that, and the other that, I, that I've kept for all these years, or papers, etc., including sermons <laughs> that I've typed up, you know, or written in longhand going back as far as 1979. And, um, you know, for me, the, the discipline of that line of work, that vocation, was to have something to say at the end of the week on Sunday morning uh, that people could take away uh, and chew on and hopefully uh, would be enlightening or encouraging in some way. That drive, in my own case, to put ideas in the service of, of ordinary folks, that, that the ideas come alive, that they can take some aspects of those ideas and uh, work with those and um, be guided or directed or find some deeper meaning, <laughs> to use the word that, that's, that, uh, that, that's been an important word for you over the years. So that, that Sunday discipline of putting something together that has some kind of a bottom line. Unfortunately, when I reread some of the things I spouted in that role years ago, I, I, I put myself to sleep. <laughs> Because some of it was pretty dry and still didn't get, I didn't get to the where the rubber meets the road very often. I'm, I'm very grateful that the people who sat there, you know, and listened, if they were asleep, they didn't let on that they were asleep, but they had every right to fall asleep. But you know, in 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 my work now, this uh, dimension of the book restoring our lives, which was to give ideas that people could use to help them to to grow autobiographically. That's still very much, uh, uh, even more so actually, uh, a powerful driving force for me. I should mention that you're invited to uh, check out some of the other episodes in this podcast series where we do talk more about what we're eventually going to talk more about, something called narrative gerontology. I think you mentioned it already. And, uh, and narrative care, both of which are are up practical ways of seeing the aging as the lifespan and based on story. So feel free to peruse some of our other episodes to uh, get more uh, insight into some of these views. Oh, I was going to say we took a chance even with writing Restoring, and we haven't talked about Ordinary Wisdom yet, but Restoring, because they're not standard academic books. So we were fortunate to uh, get a contract from a major publisher, uh, academic publisher, to do both of those books. And another aspect of that was that you and I have uh, introduced some new words to the language by way of writing, especially restoring. So words like storytelling as one word put together, 
story listening put together, co-authoring, perhaps others that you can think of. Storying style. Storying styles, signature stories. Uh, narrative environment. Narrative environment. These are all new words. And um, did you want to add? Even even the word restorying itself. I mean, lots of times people will say, oh, you, you don't want that Y in there. Yes, I do want that Y. Restorying. Not restoring, but restorying. Yeah, yeah I have to correct that a lot on the, on, on the work that I do now. Like, giving a talk and somebody reads it in the print, I have to, to catch that because it's really, really an easy one to overlook. But I remember when we um, sent a draft of the book into the publisher and one of the reviewers wrote back and said uh, they used an academic term that I I didn't really know that well until, until it happened, but neologisms. And uh, so they were upset that we would take storytelling story listening words like that and put them together as one word so this was back in 1990 95 96 so the publisher said or the editor said uh, well you know i don't know if we can you know let you do this because uh, the reviewer doesn't like it and well we both said no you know we have to stand by this this is this is important and um, it gets across the insight that we want to share and again fortunately for us they thought we were credible enough i guess i mean because you always have to hope for that i I don't want to sound too grand or whatever but if if this narrative approach to understanding aging and development is, is a little bit like a paradigm shift of sorts you know putting the emphasis more on the humanities dimension of being human than say the biological that that kind of a shift in thinking often is accompanied by or requires a shift in language. And uh, so us making up words and annoying some readers with those made up words was part of the process. It's, it may be part of the creative process, you know? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think you're right. And, um, and if you notice, interestingly enough, 20 years later, and that maybe started a few years ago, they're all putting words together now titles of corporations and titles of all this and that maybe it maybe it follows the uh, the email or internet uh, phenomenon where there can be no spaces you know, in the titles but we were on the cutting edge of that which is now quite a bit more acceptable I think so um, that was another aspect of uh, of writing that book in particular um, the other thing that you've mentioned before, is um, how quickly the books got written. I know we've talked about that, like, how did this happen? You know, we <laughs> we would find time uh, with our other research and teaching committee work duties. Remember we debated, I like to write in a cafe, and you do too. So we used to debate, okay, do we go to Tim Hortons for Canadian listeners or American listeners, or Starbucks or some other cafe? And although I'm a real coffee snob and I would have probably tried to find a real independent coffee shop, Starbucks turned out to be, the, the Starbucks that we went to in Fredericton turned out to be a very co comfortable, quiet place to generate ideas. So uh, that's what we compromised on. <laughs> we had many, many, many meetings at Starbucks, which was part of the Chapters bookstore <clears throat> in Fredericton. So there was, we were surrounded by books and people, you know, having conversations often about books and so forth. So it was a very, a very suitable kind of environment for what we were actually doing. But I can remember you would, you would have sent me a draft of a chapter that you'd written and I would have done the same for one that I'd written. I don't know when, as, I, as you say, I don't know when we found the time to do that because I don't recall us having uh, a lot of sabbaticals breaks uh, when those two books got written. Of course, I had the, the, the luxury of that very first semester at St. Thomas, 1995. Those talks that I gave, we were able to use those, or variations of those, as portions of the restoring book. And I was only teaching one course that, that semester. But we had a lot of sabbaticals or whatever that gave us the extra time that you would expect we would need to, to write those books. Perhaps we didn't, I'd just forgotten. Well, God, it, it was... Uh... It was like a wave, I, I feel like. 
it, we got into this wave and it just it just kept going so uh, that's true yeah that's true maybe we could uh talk a little bit about ordinary wisdom mm. the thing that as i was going back over ow as we affectionately call it is that our combined sort of fascination with metaphors really form the central part of that book because we took three related metaphors for thinking about life. Uh, life as story, life as journey, and life as adventure. And we were able to unpack those metaphors in a way that I think was a, was, it was a helpful process for me in, in terms of clarifying the, the narrative metaphor. It's interesting that that book, although it got some reviews, it got one quite extensive review, as you may recall, in one journal, uh, the author didn't agree with us, but they took three dense pages to to explain why they didn't agree, which it, in a sense says they took the, the book seriously. Because we teach and have taught gerontology in a liberal arts environment, we are not necessarily very strong on or have much expertise in the quantitative approach to studying topics related to aging, which does tend to be the main sort of uh, model, doesn't it? So we were literally on the outside of in the edge of the, the continent and the edge of the country in a smaller liberal arts university writing about wisdom in a way that uh, did not try to to measure it nothing wrong with psychometric instruments to measure things by any means but that's not where our passion or our expertise lies so we were able to do a kind of a philosophical psychological reflection on, you know, in what sense is life and therefore aging a story? In what sense is life and aging a, a journey and an adventure? And how do those three intertwine? And how can we how can we help people cultivate wisdom environments? Which I think is a, it's a powerful concept that we, uh, we ended up talking about in that book. And we've talked about that concept quite a bit, Gary, you and I, in, in subsequent things that we've done together. Yeah, and and maybe we'll talk more about that at some point. It, uh, it's a pretty powerful and useful concept. Yeah, for me, the uh, the ordinary wisdom, I was writing it partly uh, as a philosopher, again, going back to my roots, reading some of these journal articles and other books about wisdom, which, as you say, try to measure wisdom, for example. Although we have a highly respected colleague Jeff Webster and we've we've had debates with him over the years and good debates over mm -hmm. over that aspect and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with uh, with however we approach these phenomena but certainly for me as a philosopher having studied the rich history of wisdom not only in the western tradition but buddhism and uh, hinduism and uh, because I'm a tai chi practitioner taoism it seemed that the field needed a book that put some more substance besides quantitative measurements of wisdom or kind of correlating it with cleverness or intelligence or some sort of problem solving. That may be useful in certain you know areas, as most theories are, but it just seemed to fall short for me. There's more to say. There was more to say for us and for, for all of us to uh, look at when we're uh, studying the concept of wisdom. And I, uh, and I like the way we did put that book together. The uh, story journey, as I've already mentioned, has been a metaphor I've been interested in and I'm still interested in. Adventure is something you've been interested in and you're in the process of being very interested in that as you continue on right now. So um, again, that book was, uh, I feel, I think you would agree, is it's another contribution to field of gerontology and beyond gerontology for we as human beings to have another way to look at wisdom with some guidelines, with some guidelines to follow for your own life. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier, but it's almost as if, you know, starting uh, with our graduate study work, your dissertation, my dissertation, your dissertations, because you, you had the master's thesis as well as the doctoral thesis, but it's like those projects themselves, you know, opened up a, a wealth of ideas and possibilities that basically we've been continuing to pursue and play with ever since. And each of the books, Restoring Our Lives and Ordinary Wisdom, is a kind of a taking of some 
aspects of our earlier work and developing it further. And that's that organic kind of sense of all these thoughts and ideas are, are connected and they're rooted in, in, our own, in our own lives and our own journeys and our own adventures. That's about as good as it gets, I think, Gary, because lots of times we can do university studies or write degrees or theses or whatever. And once you get it done, it's done there. I did it, got the piece of paper. That's all I care about. But to have, to have your early work sort of lay the, the foundation for a, a life project is, is wonderful, I feel. And, and it's what we've been able to experience, each of us, and the, the, for our two life projects to converge in the various ways that they have in terms of publications and so forth is a, it's a double gift. <laughs> Definitely, Bill. And uh, I would suggest this is a good place for us to, to end this episode and say to the listeners, uh, to be continued. And we have, uh, in the next episode, I think we'll continue talking about perhaps our students and conferences we've gone to. I'd like you to share with the listeners a little more about, uh, well, we can mention again, uh, uh, narrative gerontology, narrative care, and also, um, I think it would be really interesting to talk a bit about the Narrative Matters conference series. So those are some things we could continue on with in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Pathways to Stillness podcast series. My book, Pathways to Stillness, Reflect, Release, Renew, is available on Amazon, Indigo Chapters, and Friesen Press. It is also available in audiobook form from Audible, Amazon, and iTunes.